Hey team, we're going to finish up um, clip video 4.2 here. So we're going to expand into our discussion of ethnicity by just uh, looking specifically about the ethnic distribution within the United States. <coughs> uh, something that's important to know specifically because it connects to our discussions of migration and um, of uh, just simply the U.S. And its, and its cultural identity. So if you look at the map of ethnic distribution in the United States, the, the key factor that explains this current distribution of ethnicity is migration, migration patterns that um, help us understand, for example, why African Americans are largely distributed in the Southeast, why Latin Americans or Hispanics, as I should more properly say, um, are distributed in the southwestern part of the United States, tracing back to early migration patterns of um, European settlers coming to the United States, white European settlers coming to, the United, to then the 13 colonies, helps us understand some of the ethnic patterns that exist um, up here in the northeastern region of the United States. So we're going to focus on the largest ethnic groups in the United States. Um, the, uh, and I'm gonna, we're going to look at where those ethnic groups are located and the factors that explain that. We'll start with Asian Americans. <coughs> the two states with the largest concentration of Asian Americans are California and Hawaii. Now, just from a sheer geographic perspective, that makes sense, given that those two states are two of the states that are most closely located, uh, that, are, that are physically close to the Asian continent. The two uh, largest groups of Asian Americans would be 25% of the Asian Americans are Chinese, 20% of Asian Americans are Filipino. A rising group there would also be uh, Indian Americans. Larger, large, increasing number of Indian Americans coming to the United States, or Indians coming to the United States. Hawaii, uh, Asian Americans comprise two thirds of the population. I should also say that some of the I'm using this term Asian Americans um, that can reference both people who are citizens of the United States. Uh, this would also just be uh, eight people of Asian descent is what I'm referring to more generally. So two thirds of Hawaii's population um, is of Asian descent, and half of Asian Americans live in California. Um, so you can see the dense concentration there. And the factors that explain that modern distribution of Asian Americans are just simply the migration from China, from the Philippines, that, that of course is explained in the, in the concentration of Chinese and Filipinos, from Japan and from India. Um, these, these are both historic and modern migration patterns. Um, and that helps us see the percentage of Asians there. Hispanic Americans or Hispanics. Uh, there's also a different terminology here. Um, this terminology, Hispanic, Latino, Chiqui, Chiqui, Chicano, Chicana, excuse me, I'm going to clarify. Um, Hispanic and, and Latino, there's, sometimes it's uh, a preference to, um, term here. Others feel that there are uh, terms that are more accurate than others in explaining the heritage of the people. I'm going to use the term Hispanic, but the term Latino is often used um, by certain groups as well. Hispan and Chicano Chicana actually is specifically a term that references Mexican Americans. Chicano referring to a male Mexican, and a um, Chicana referring to a female Mexican. So those are all terminology that um, are applicable here. <coughs> Hispanic Americans are primarily concentrated in the Southwest, in the states of Texas, to the border states here, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. And that is the, a product of, of migration from Latin America. So you can see those are areas with large Latin American concentrations. You also notice the growing po uh, population here as well in Florida. Uh, I think if I give you this map in maybe 30 years from now, we'll probably see an increase. If this was broken down by country of origin, we would see a larger concentration of um, migrants coming from Cuba. Since relations were just re uh, re uh, diplomatic relations were just restored with Cuba. So you can see... Um, Again, geography helps us just understand this map here. If we look at the distribution of Native Americans, and Native Americans we see primarily in the Midwest, up here in the Mont in Montana, in the Dakotas. Uh, we see concentration in Colorado. I want you to also note here that we've got New Mexico and Arizona in these regions, as well as here in Oklahoma. Now, the Oklahoma specific, oh, I'm sorry, in Alaska. I apologize, it's not on there. Alaska, of course, has a large concentration of Native Americans. Now, the factors that explain this clustered distribution of Native Americans is the forced migration of Native Americans to reservations. Uh, many of you have learned this in your history classes, but just in case you haven't, 
Uh, the United States made a very specific and deliberate effort to remove Native Americans from the land that they were living on as the United States was being settled <coughs> and established. Um, one particular um, forcible migration that's most known was undertaken by President Andrew Jackson, who was known very much for his aggressive policies and oppressive policies towards Native Americans. Uh, this He forced Native Americans to undergo, specifically a Cherokee, to undergo a forcible migration out of down here out of the southwest, excuse me, southeast, uh, in the Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina territory, uh, and were forced on a, on a terrible, terrible journey known as the Trail of Tears to settlement here in Oklahoma. Um, so the Native American reservations are, are certainly not coincidental. They were the product of forced migration of Native Americans. Now the one we're going to study about in a little more detail here is the modern distribution of African Americans in the United States. Now again, we've already mentioned this, that slavery <coughs> helps us understand the um, initial concentration of African Americans in the southeastern part of the United States, uh, as that's where slavery was predominant and um, where slaves were brought to predominantly. Please don't forget that uh, slaves, that only 10% of enslaved Africans were taken to the United States. 90% of enslaved Africans went to Central and South America, which helps explain the ethnic distribution of, um, of blacks in modern day in, in Central and South America. So keep that in mind because ethnicity is a global concept, not simply the United States, as a slavery was mod had modern uh, global implications. So slavery helps us understand the large concentration, but what we need to focus on is you see of circled areas um, in different regions of the U.S. where there is a very large population of African Americans, and those are urban areas. Um, so you can see the areas I've circled, and you can see those are areas of uh, D.C., for example, you know, Chicago, Detroit, um, here in the Houston, Austin, Dallas regions. San Francisco, we've got Los Angeles. Um, so these are regions, these are urban regions. And the reason, what what explains that distribution is known as the Great Migration. Um, the, and the dates of the Great Migration are pretty, are not um, universally agreed upon, but I'm going to give us the dates, a very broadest definition, around 1910 to 1970. Um, so this area is the early 20th century, essentially capturing between World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War era. This is when African Americans uh, were leaving en masse. To, they were leaving the segregated and oppressive South for slightly, you know, I use that term pretty liberally, slightly better opportunities and better uh, access to equality in Northern and Western cities. A lot of people forget about the West, so please don't forget about that. I like this map here. Um, I've used it in my history classes in the past uh, because it really does a nice job of showing some of these major routes for the uh, Great Migration. Many of the people who are left uh, Kansas and Nebraska, excuse me, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, it's Kansas and Nebraska, excuse me, are, um, were known as exodusters. We have learned about the exodusters before they were seeking to establish their own communities. But you can see here these routes, uh, they definitely went west to Oakland, um, specifically in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles. We have uh, urban areas, and this is, this is a product of the fact that the United States was industrializing um, on a large scale. We have that global, we have that uh, wartime economy, and a lot of jobs are available in factories that were not uh, available before. But on the whole, um, and this is a picture, by the way, from Aaron Lawrence, who's a wonderful, wonderful artist. You know, and he has fantastic pictures of the Great Migration that you should check out. Um, but the Great Migration helps us understand um, that the distribution of the modern day distribution and concentration of African Americans within urban areas. However, what helps us understand the segregated nature of the, this distribution. In other words, it's not as if our cities in modern day are particularly, um, they're, they're, well, let me phrase it this way, even to this day, cities remain segregated. And that's not, that is a product of the racist and uh, oppressive policies that the United States had in place. So those policies can be summarized as the separate but equal policy. That was the verdict in the 1896 uh, Plessy versus Ferguson court case <coughs> that legalized segregation in all public facilities. So, so, so um, slavery has ended in, after the Civil War, but in a court case, again, Plessy versus Ferguson, the, the verdict was that school it was completely legal for schools and public buildings and public transportation to be legally segregated. That's where we see those 
uh, signs, or, uh, many of you are familiar with them, his historical signs of white versus colored, a term that's um, pejorative now, but a separate but equal policy ensured that uh, whites and blacks lived, uh, were physically separated. Other policies that helped ensure that physical separation, one is known as block busting. Now this can be um, easily confused with redlining, so I'm going to help differentiate it. Block busting was the process when real estate agents, white real estate agents, would, um, would get white families to sell their homes in neighborhoods because of, out of fear that African Americans would, le would move into the neighborhood. So they'd sell their home typically at a very low price and then they, those same criminal real estate agents would sell those homes to black uh, families moving in at, at much, much, much higher rates. And so it was uh, just, again, another terribly um, racist policy and practice that is illegal, but happened all the time. That led to what's known as white flight. So the uh, white families that lived in cities were fleeing en masse to the suburbs, <coughs> leading to this geographic segregation between whites and blacks. Another policy that helped maintain that segregation was a po another illegal policy known as redlining. And redlining was or were illegal actions taken by banks whereby minorities are just refused loans in predominantly white neighborhoods. The term, um, I thought I had a picture of it, but um, imagine this that someone just looked at this, and this is illegal, but this was just, uh, and I, I'm a little cautious about the, the, the historic integrity of this map, but I found this in my searches that uh, this is Richmond, Virginia. Envision just a uh, bank looking at this map and just drawing a big red X across a different region of the of that city. Um, and what that meant is that that because they didn't want to give loans to African Americans, so that meant that uh, African Americans couldn't move in. Uh, it also just generally speaking made it difficult for African Americans to own homes, which led to increase in turn led to geographic segregation because they had to live in areas where people were willing to rent to them. So this was a way to keep African Americans um, disempowered, I guess that's why I say that. Uh, again, illegal, but incredibly common in the history of the United States. That helps understand why cities remain as segregated and why uh, modern day regions remain segregated. Um, so the blockbusting, redlining, and, and just simply segregation and separate but equal uh, policies have helped maintain or helped create segregated places that to this day remain. So these are not coincidental things that whites and blacks don't live together in many regions of the United States. Those were policies that started and uh, both because of modern day inequities and just and choice in many instances, uh, those, those segregated areas remain. Now in modern day, we actually have an opposite situation happening. Now, let me just talk about this very briefly because we're going to come back to this in a second. What we see is that upper class whites, and this is very modern right now, this is like within the last really 10 years, <coughs> upper class, middle class whites are now returning to cities and uh, looking for new amenities, and, um, want access to the city life. And that's increasingly squeezing minorities, in many cases African Americans, out of the city, and uh, that's leading to what's known as this rise, this modern rise of suburban poverty, where uh, many places, and this is disproportionately affecting African Americans and, and Hispanics, that these uh, that property taxes go up, people can't afford to live, the rent goes up, and many uh, minorities are now being forced out of places that were once um, out of cities, for example. So this is a very modern trend that's affecting the ethnic distribution of the United States and something we'll come back to in these study cities. So there it is. There's our uh, analysis of ethnic uh, distribution in the United States. For a second question that says, how will current migration patterns affect the future distribution of African Americans, Latin Americans, Asian Americans, and Native Americans? I'd like you to consider what you know about migration and uh, migration patterns and how that's going to affect where these ethnicities will be distributed, say, 10, 15, 20 years down the road. All right, that's it. Thanks, guys.